All right, it's 4.40. I got here at 4.30. I got up at four this morning and I'm at the girls' estate sale shop. Someone just got here. And I thought I was early, but <laughs> no, there's a bunch of people here already. So apparently I'm later than I thought, but there's one item I'm after, but if anyone else recognizes what it is, then I don't have a shot, but we'll see. I don't know if you guys can see, but there's some items sitting out on the sidewalk there in front of the door. Those are all of our markers lined up. So I don't know, we'll see um, when they get here to hand out the numbers. I'm probably gonna be like, I don't know, by the looks of it, probably like number 10 or something. So we'll see. They're gonna be opening in about 10 minutes. How much is it? Did you see it's it? It's $33. Is it? Yeah, I saw the tag before okay. I peeked in the window. We we'll get somebody it's to a put it camel a tag saddle. On. Look at the look at the shape of it. Let's see. Yeah, that looks like a camel saddle. <laughs> I mean an authentic one. Got it. It was worth it. But you never know, you could show up really early and someone in line before you wants the same thing, so you never know. Okay, we're getting ready to go. And there's just no one around. And we're picking up at the hold section. So they'll hold your items if you have larger items or whatever, and they'll write the tag up there. Anybody else need to see now? Yeah, it's hiding back there. <laughs> Yeah, so this part comes off, so you don't even need to keep that, right? Or yeah, the cushion I can recover or make Let's a different see. one because it's a little rough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love finding absurd pieces of furniture. Like the weirder, the better. That goes for plants and uh, home decor. So these are vintage, and I tried to get one, um, I tried to bid on one on the online auction and lost it because uh, someone else, yeah, it this went. This one was 33. Yep, 33 bucks. Oh, there we go. It's Turkey. Yeah, Turkey. there you go. Okay. All right. Welcome to your new home, little camel. I think you'll fit in beautifully. I'm going to make it a new cushion, though, because this one's pretty beat up. I'll use it as a template though. Look, now the llama has a friend. Now it's not all by itself. I think you two will get along perfectly. So I'm gonna be vlogging all weekend with you guys. We're gonna be going to the gym shows later and I normally don't share, you know, the glamorous highlights of my life like scrubbing toilets, bathtubs, and sinks, but that's what I'm doing this morning before we head out to the gym shows. And I forgot. You guys had asked me before what I was using as a cleanser. I really like this Barkeeper's Friend. And I mentioned it before, but I don't think I showed the actual bottle or the, you know, the package, what it looks like. So Barkeeper's Friend, it's for, wait, which one do I have here? These are both the same. One has, okay, this is a fresh one I just opened because that one's almost empty. It's for kitchen and bathroom. Um, so it's really handy for everything from pots and pans, you know, getting that burnished, uh, those burnished marks off of your pots and pans to cleaning, you know, porcelain and your bathtub and everything. It's awesome. So normally I find it at Walmart and it works amazing on so many things. So I sprinkle the barkeeper's friend all over here already and then I get it wet, spray it with a little water and just let it sit on there. So I clean it once and then if I feel like it needs a second round, then I'll do it one more time. And this is perfect because everything's already wet, so when you sprinkle on the barkeeper's friend, it just sticks to it really well. So I'll just sprinkle that over everything. The faucets, same because it helps take off all the uh, hard water. And then around the drain, I try to get around that really well too because that's where the water tends to um, build up and you get that hard water. I'll let that sit on there and then I will take my little handy toothbrush here. I use that to get right around all the details, you know, around the faucets and handles and down around the drain there. And up here it says stainless steel, porcelain, ceramic, copper, brass, fiberglass, chrome, aluminum. So yeah, it removes mineral deposits, soap scum, rust stains. Uh, for our faucets, toilets, tile, grout, clean sinks, tubs, showers. Uh, so yeah, overall, love that stuff. It does a really good job. All right, so we'll let that sit and let me go ahead and start on, um, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and do the mirrors here real quick. Got my vinegar and water. That's what I use for cleaning the glass and some of the windows. You know, I just realized it's been a while since I've dusted up top here. 
yeah, <laughs> that needs to get cleaned up there. Oh, shoot, yeah. This, oh man, my light bulbs are dusty. Holy cow, look at that it's snowing in here. I don't know, dusting light bulbs is just not something that you normally think of doing, you know? I don't, at least I don't. It's like one of the last things on my cleaning list. Especially those light bulbs, they really collect a lot of dust, especially the ones that are coming out horizontally like that. That dust just like sits right on the very top there. Let's get above here too. I'm gonna wipe this down again, just in case I got dust bunnies that fell on there. A little more vinegar. Super dusty windowsill, oh my gosh. It's been like probably at least a few weeks since I dusted this windowsill. It's amazing how much gets caught up in here though. Okay, I'll clean the counters. So I just wanna give this a quick wipe down and I gotta go out and get more sponges too. I just got my little toothbrush getting in here around the faucet handles. And around here. All right, sink and counter area look good. I'll put the soap back. And we have family coming in. They're gonna be staying in this room. And so that's why I wanna get this all taken care of uh, today. Cause I think they're coming in either later today or tomorrow, I'm not sure. All right, next I'm gonna work on the bathtub and I'm taking down the old shower liner. I need to replace that. So I've been meaning to do that. And so I've got a new shower liner that I'm gonna go wash right now. All right, new shower liners. Okay, the shower liner's finished washing, so I got those hung, and we gotta head out right now, so we gotta get to work. You would never guess that there was anything special like hidden inside this stone, right? Oh, there you go. Look at that reveal. Yeah. Just glowing. Another one here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unreal. So that is, is something else. This is Egyptian turquoise. Look at the color in there. Oh. I love and the And this contest, is Egyptian though. turquoise. Yeah, sir. Sure. Look at that. From the rough. Here we are. Sun West. Show me here. Oh yeah, that's nice. What are you Look asking at, for that one? For this one I want eleven thousand. Wow. Eleven thousand? This is the this is the uh, iron color right there yeah. and this is uh, another mineral, this is Ejularia. And then it's double terminated and right here it's the mica, muscovite. Whoa. And that crystal you see, the colorful that yeah. crystal that's double terminated too. On the other side, it's terminated too. So that's why it's special piece because both crystals there, it's both are double terminated. This piece is anatase. Anatase this much big in size, it's it's rare. It's it's, it's rare, you know, that much that much together anatase crystals and that much big size. And the crystals uh, right now in the light, you see this is like blackish, you know, but yeah. it's when you go to the sunlight, it's blue. Oh. It gets blue. Uh -huh. Bluish shade. You can see the, some of the aquamarine's cloudier. And see some of these nice pieces, like look up here, compared to this one right here. Look at how crystal clear that one is. Look at that. Yeah, right back here. That one is super beautiful. Yeah. Complete crystal, natural, no damage, beautiful termination. Beautiful. And the clouds in there are gorgeous too. And look at this. You guys know what this is? Pink tourmaline. That one's from Afghanistan. But most of these from uh, Pakistan. Pakistan. He's got really nice specimens here. That one is beautiful too. So we're at Jobs right now. Normally you can't really film in here, but you know, we're, we're kind of doing it. Like we go into each individual booth and ask them first, and then if they okay it, then I go ahead and get some shots for you guys. This one is Sapphire. Sapphire person. Oh, is it really? Sapphire. 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 
Wow, look at how clear that one is too. Where? Oh yeah, yeah. Now I'm looking at all the loose stones. Look at these Herkimer diamonds. Look at that. Don't you just want to bathe in those? They're so beautiful. They're so sparkly. Oh, there's some more. What did you find? I don't know. It looks like a tech type. Oh, and here we go. Here we go. I'm gonna get out of the way. We got. Come on. Don't tell me you don't want to bathe in that. Here, let's touch it. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's just so nice. I love touching these stones. Ooh, I love that. There's more. It's all different sizes here. Oh. <laughs> there's some larger pieces there. This, this is why I love my job so much, and there's nothing that I'd rather be doing than being involved in the gemstone world and cactus plants and on here on YouTube with you guys. Look at this Libyan desert glass. That is a very special tech type. He's got more in here too. So these come from the Sahara Desert, from the Great Sand Sea. I normally look for the pieces that have pitting or some sort of interesting facet. I like it. Yeah. Okay, we're home now and I'm still cleaning, so I gotta start in the bathtub now. So I'm just taking down the old shower liner. I gotta clean the bathtub and stuff. First, I like to get it wet, so I'll just turn on the faucet really quick, and then I sprinkle on the barkeeper spray. Up on the sides, a little bit. Up on the faucet. Okay, it's been sitting for about 10 minutes, and now I'll just give it a good scrub, and then I'll let that sit for a few more minutes, and then I'll do a rinse, and sometimes I'll do it once more if it needs it. Um, so, I will do this scrubbing. Okay, so that's been sitting for about 10 minutes now. I'll go ahead and give it a scrub, and the barkeeper's friend works really well on all the chrome too. So on the faucets, it takes off the hard water, and. Um, everything like all the water spots and everything so I'll go ahead and scrub this down and I'll be right back all right bathtub's nice and clean got the bath mat up there and I was just finishing hanging up this uh, this new liner I don't know I don't know how this is gonna be I mean I like the idea that, that it's uh, fabric rather than that um, I don't know that polyurethane type you know the little vinyl type of liners that they have oh yeah I was always using those but you know what I was like you know let's go ahead and give this fabric a try and just see if it works. So, um, you know, as long as this uh, thing doesn't end up soaked and dripping on the floor, I think we should be good. Is the llama welcoming you? Is it being nice to you? What's going on? You just look a little sad. It's because I took away your cushion, isn't it, huh? Well, I had to put that outside. It was kind of dirty. Yeah, I'm going to use it as a, as a template to make you a new cushion. You don't, you don't want to wait, huh? Okay. Well, let me, let me see what I can find you. Maybe uh, maybe a piece of fabric that might tide you over. No, it's gotta be nice, okay. Like, do you like something maybe fluffy or do you prefer like a faux leather? Okay, let me see what I can find. Okay, Let, let's see how you feel about this. Okay, let's give you a little fluff here. How's that? Do you like that a little better? Yeah. Oh, you love it, okay. Nice and cozy, comfortable, not so naked, all right. Uh oh, someone's someone's jealous back here. The llama, the the llama feels like the it should be wearing the fluff. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna have to work this out. Hey guys, we're in the beautiful plant paradise known as B and B Cactus Nursery. Uh, last time we were out here, I promised that I would film more next time because last time I couldn't film very much. Here's a type of mesimes known as baby toes. I don't know what their actual name is, but they're really cool plants. Here's the lithops table. They're not in bloom yet. It's still a little early, but maybe in a few weeks. Ah, they did put out some new lithops though. These little pots of clusters. And look at these over here. And look at those, they are adorable. I mean, they're weird as heck, but super cute. 
And we got one in bloom. Look at that. That looks like it's a fresh flower too. And these normally will open up their blooms in the afternoon time. So I'm a little early. It's high noon right now. I mean, how weird are these things? They're like some sort of alien life form or something. Weirdos. I absolutely love them. Wouldn't that be cool to go to Namibia and actually go see these in the wild? Look at this. This is a seed pod in the center here. Old seed pod. And right there too. Look at these. Sweet. I've got some lithop seeds at home from my, uh, one of my lithops I had a seed pod that I harvested not too long ago. And we'll definitely have to plant those up. We really like the top reds. Here, let's come over here. I think there's one. Wait, where is it? Here we go. Here's one top red here. Those are some of my favorite. And we've got a bowl of Tillandsia. These are pretty crazy, huh? Have you ever seen these in the Atacama Desert in Chile? Oh, they are awesome the way they grow over and like in clumps and on rocks and stuff. Oh, they're amazing. Let's get in close and look at them. So the trichomes almost create this white, fuzzy kind of look to the Tillandsias. And some of these Tillandsias grow in the desert where they only get fog, and that's how they survive. So the trichomes is how they get their moisture and nutrients. Really neat Tillandsia bulb though. I like it. I look at these beautiful agaves, these Victoria Regine. I always love the look of the leaves. Aren't those gorgeous, the markings? It almost looks like it's been painted, doesn't it? Oh, check out that Echeveria. That is gorgeous. You know what? The colors are not going to... The camera's not going to do the colors justice, but look at that Echeveria. That's like this pink and frosty blue. So pretty. Parodia Magnifica. Oh my gosh, those things just create amazing mountains. Look at the pattern on those. Just gorgeous. So being a cactus geek, the cactus greenhouse here is my favorite greenhouse to go in and I could be in here for at least like two hours straight just like looking at every single cactus. Look at this Glosaliana. Oh my gosh, look at that fuzzy baby. It is just so sweet. I love it. Look at this one over here. Gorgeous. Oh, they got a bunch of new trees in. Look at that. See all that pink tape? So they tape off where um, like the sections of new cactuses still have to be priced and have their tags be. Ooh, look at those. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm gonna get some. I don't have anything in my basket yet, but I had to set that down and look over here. These, these right here. What is that? I need to know. Anyone recognize this one? Okay, which one do we like? So I don't know how much this one is, but I'm into this. Look at that, those feathery radial spines. Look at those spines, those gorgeous fluffy white radial spines in combination with the, the darker central spines. Look at the pattern on top of these. Do you see that geometric pattern on the very top? And how their spines just kind of, like the aerials just kind of swirl down and around. Pretty darn cute. Okay, those are just absolutely adorable. So far, I've got one down there. Ooh, nice. Look at those. Sweet. Got some astrophytums here. Astrophytum Capricorn. We got a little pot of astrophytums here. Uh oh. Oh, it looks like something was nibbling on their astrophytum. You know the beauty of cactus is really in their intricacy. Some people are really into their spines and then some people are really into their blooms. Um, I like both, uh, but I tend to be into the spines first and then blooms is kind of secondary. It's so hard to choose, but I think we're going to go with this one. Okay, this one part. I was looking for the Escobaria uh, tuberculosa, but I only see those. I think they have some that were going into bloom somewhere here. Let's see if we can find them. Oh, look at all those. Did you guys recognize those? I've done some videos on them in the past. Those are the Arizona rainbow cactus. 
otherwise known as Echinocereus ridiculous. I was just running by here and look, there they are. Escobario tuberculosa. Okay, this one's not in bloom, but it has all these babies around it. That would be a good one to get. The ones that are like this, this one, is it growing any babies? It, I mean, it's got a couple little nubs down there. Now, as much as I love these things, I, I'm a little bit shallow when it comes to the shape of my cactus. I don't, I don't really want them looking like a phallic symbol. You know, like I don't want a, a big old phallic symbol hanging out in my backyard for everyone, you know, Google Earth to be seeing what I've got back there. But I think that this one, this one's gonna grow out enough. It's got enough pups going on, so no offense. Um, you're gonna be beautiful with those blooms, I'm sure, but I'm, I'm gonna have to go with this one. But that one, I've got a bunch of pups, and I'm gonna leave that to clumping and filling out, and I think it'll turn out beautifully. But these do have absolutely gorgeous flowers. Look at that, there's another one. Oh, look at that. That one's like, what the heck is happening to me? This, this looks very dangerous. Your little naked body uh, right next to those spines. I, I don't know, can we help it out a little? I don't know, let's see. Let's see if we can help it. Ooh. Well, oh my gosh, that thing has some weight to it. Oh, uh-oh. Is it, is it stabbing the one back there too? Oh god, we got a cactus fight going on. Uh-oh. This thing doesn't even have hooks. Okay, there we go. I kind of, I kind of like when they're crawling out of the pot. You know, just kind of like they're, they're they want to see what else is out there in the world. They don't want to stay in one place. I mean, imagine being a plant. Right? Wherever you get put, that's it. You don't get to, like, you know, go hang out in the shade in the afternoon and sip, you know, iced teas or anything. Wherever they put you, that's where you sit all day, all night. I gotta I got invest in some more uh, shade cloth. So, see, like, this black shade cloth in the, in the greenhouse next to us there? That's a uh, 50% shade cloth there. They've got 70% too. It's usually, like, a light tan or something. And you can, uh, you can combine them also. That'll help them out a bit. That way, you know, they can sit under the shade cloth and sip their iced tea and, or, you know, whatever, whatever you like to water them with. Now, part of the attraction to cactus is definitely the spines and the formation of the spines. You know, we got the central spines and you got the little radial spines that protect the body of the cactus. These, you can, you can tell what those are for, right? Those are for fending off predators or anyone that might want to, ow. <laughs> Jeez, good grief, I was trying to watch out for that one, they both got me. So the central spines are to protect the cactus from anyone who might want to come along and nibble, you know, like pack rats or, you know, any other little uh, critters out there who might want to take a bite out of the cactus. Now, the question is, where does this thing live that it needs spines the size of toothpicks? I mean, I'm not sure exactly what type of animals this thing is fending off, but that thing is not messing around. I mean, look look how cute those are. Come on, look how adorable. Look at that one back there. These are hedgehogs, by the way. How cute is that? Hedgehog cactus? A little cousin it back there. So we got Della cactus bicolor. We got one in bloom, or going into bloom back here. Lovely. This one has some interesting color patterns on it. And so the colors that you see here are not anthocyanins, how you would normally see in, you know, fruits and vegetables and other types of plants. But in cactus, you have betalanes. Betalanes are what color the cactus spines, the cactus flowers. So you've got beta-cyanins that do the red-purple tones, and then you've got beta-xanthins that do the yellow-orange tones. And so that's what we got a lot of going on on these cell cactus bicolors. So those betalanes are also what colors the cactus flowers. Let's look over here now. There's a whole mix of different cacti on this table. But I want to see this one that's in bloom here. Oh, look at that sweet little thing. It looks like it's snow-capped with these tiny little pink blossoms. Let's get in there and see. That is just about the sweetest little baby. Look at that. Oh my gosh, I want to take it home with me. It's $10. I don't know what that one is. Out oh, here, let me zoom out. Probably making you guys dizzy. I'm telling you guys, with cactus, it's the details. The fascination with them is all about the details. And look at that one. Where has that one been doing battle? That one is armed and ready. It's got some fluffy white wool in there, making it look kind of cute though. 
What? Look at all the wool growing in that one. Do you see that? See all that white? That's that's cactus wool. I really want a scarf made out of cactus wool, but I imagine it'd be really difficult to do and probably pretty expensive by the time you actually got enough wool together to be able to make the yarn to make the scarf. But, you know, that's an idea. Who knows, though? I also wouldn't want to steal the wool from the cactus because, you know, it probably needs it. But look at that. That one is just crazy. What, what, I need to know what this thing is. Who is this woolly mammoth here? Mammalaria columbiana? Hmm. I'm gonna have to look up and see what color blooms that one has. Okay, so I looked up the Mammillaria columbiana and they said that this species is extremely variable, which means that it's gonna look a whole bunch of different ways. And this is one of its looks right here. It also said medium, well, it's axles. So the axle are where the wool is growing, right? So we got the tubercles, those are the parts that are poking out. And then the axles are like in there, right? Like more of the stem, just above the tubercles. So that's where they put out the wool, and it says that these are medium wooly to densely wooly. I think this is a densely wooly one. We'll keep that one in mind. I'm still kind of hooked on uh, the snow-capped one here. Oh, sweet baby. Look at the Mammillaria haniana. They got a few blooms on there, but they get really gorgeous when this whole thing goes into um, the halo buds, where it forms all the way around. Oh, they are just stunning. Look at this Copiapoa. That is a weird looking thing, isn't it? That's got some really unusual coloration. That's got some really interesting wool there. It looks like old insulation from the 50s or something. It's all yellowed and... I mean, it, you know, the combination looks pretty with the light green and then those like really pale uh, spines on it. Look at this Mammillaria gymnospina going off with seed pods. Look at all those little cactus fruits. They've got the tiniest little fruits, but they've got a bunch of seeds in there. I always think of them as seed pods rather than fruits, but you could eat them if you wanted to. I don't know what they taste like. I've never tasted Mammillaria uh, fruit before. You know, I swear botany is just fascinating. Just learning the plants of the world. All right, we're loading the babies up. Okay, let's head on out. Oh, hello, Mammillaria bulliae. These are some afternoon bloomers here. This is Mammillaria scumanii. Both of these are pretty prolific bloomers, especially this bulliae. That one just keeps on putting out new buds and flowers. See those bright yellow open stigmas? They are ready to be pollinated. The stigmas on this one are looking a little closed up still, so I might wait and get that one tomorrow. But it looks like this bulliae is ready to go. I'll go get my brush and pollinate those, and oh, oh my gosh, look at that one. I'm sorry, little baby. I didn't even see you over here. Look at that thing. It's got tiny, itty-bitty little flowers. Okay, I got an ant pollinator up there right now. Anyway, so look at the blooms on this one. Can we get in closer? Let's try to get in closer here. I don't know if I can get this to come up on camera, you guys. I need to buy a macro lens, because I this is just... Yeah, no, we need to buy a macro lens. <laughs> I'm gonna have to save up for that because uh, I need to be able to get into the flowers a little closer. Not to mention the spines on these and the wool. Look at the wool on this. Oh, did I mention this is a Mammillaria gymnospina? Um, long spine. So this is one of the really long spine. Let's pull back here. Gorgeous, look at that hairdo. We love it, yes. And those tiny flowers, very sweet. Okay, ants, make sure you're doing your job. Don't be crawling on this unless you're pollinating. Come on now, what are you doing? Get to work. As if ants ever stop working. They are an inspiration to me. That one's got seed pods. Mammillaria bocasana. Got another seed pod poking out of that one. Mammillaria bocasanas are very prolific uh, seed producers. They really pop out a lot of those. Alright you, I'm gonna go grab my brush and I'll be right back. Let's do this one. That one's a little itty bitty one. Grab up some of that pollen that we knocked off there that's on the petals inside. Can you see that pollen on the tip there? All that yellow? Nice, that one's a- oh, oh hold on. <laughs> uh, you guys probably want to see what I'm doing here. Alright, wait, are we in focus? Let's make sure we're in focus here. Come on now. There we go. Okay. Okay, so we're just going to stick the tip of the brush right in there. Pretend your little bee bumbling around in there. Getting all that pollen stuck to the sticky stigma. Sticky stigma. Okay. 
Now, let's take some pollen from this flower. Very nice, and we'll move to the next stigma. Beautiful. Take some pollen from that flower. Load up pollen on our brush. Move to the next one. That's the one we started with. Pollination doesn't always take. You can always increase your chances by pollinating every day that the flowers are open. So instead of just doing it once, I'm going to do this every day that these flowers are open. And then once they take, usually the flowers close up pretty quickly. Um, so I will see if that takes. Otherwise, I'll be back again tomorrow and pollinating again. Now these flowers are pretty young here, they just barely open. I wasn't even sure if they were going to be opening today, but the buds just, you know, you put these things out in the sun and they just take off, it really makes the buds open. The more sun they get, the more they flower, um, but they're in kind of like filtered sun. Oh, I just got caught, my camera got <laughs> caught on the tree here. Oh, watch out for the trees in the desert, jeez, these things, everything's got spikes, everything's got spines, everything wants to kill you in the desert. Now, I'm not sure how people pronounce it here. Is it a Palo Verde tree or a Palo Verde tree? I'm not sure. But if you look closely at it, uh, it has this lovely green epidermis here. It's, it's a lovely green bodied tree. Very, very unusual. And if we look even closer, you can see it does have spikes on it. You might be able to see some of those there. But if given the opportunity, these will stab you, so you've got to be careful of that. Now if we look at this particular spike even closer, perhaps you might be able to see some of my own epidermis still stuck to the tip of this. And that normally happens when I'm reaching around back here, trying to move my plants around. But you know, it's not like the tree is trying to hurt you, it doesn't mean to, it's just that you, it wasn't expecting you to stick your hand onto its spike, right? Which is exactly what I did. So I don't blame the tree, uh, it's just my own, my own hand <laughs> running into it while I'm fussing around out here but eventually I will get a better setup for my plants so I can keep them safe from the sun and still happy. All right so here we are I had to stop and make a smoothie and I didn't really have much to make the smoothie so I used peaches, bananas, vanilla, a little bit of coconut and let's see what was oh yeah uh, some toasted coconut almond milk too. I need to go to the store and go grocery shopping but it turned out pretty good. I like it. It tastes exactly like a milkshake. Oh and I saw a couple of you guys had asked if I would do more food videos or wellness videos again. I can definitely do that. Anything you guys want to see I'm always up for doing requested videos. Um, I mean if it's something that I n normally do like if it's something I know how to do I'm happy to do any requested videos for you guys is what I'm trying to say. Um, if I know how to do it or can share some information or whatever I'm happy to share with you guys more. So I don't really do a lot of food videos though because I do have those food sensitivities and I still have those uh, the same as last year. It has not changed. I don't know if you guys really want to see what I eat though because I feel like it's so simple that it wouldn't be very interesting to you guys. Just because, uh, you know, most of the time I'm eating whole foods. I eat really simple meals where there's not a lot of ingredients and I hardly ever use any spices at all. So um, like I don't use condiments and I don't really flavor stuff up a whole lot because I can't because of my food allergies, uh, well food sensitivities. So anyway, that's why I eat like really, really simple. Uh, and I, I don't know if people, like I don't know if anyone else would find what I eat really very interesting. But uh, it works for me and I gotta do what I gotta do to uh, you know protect myself from uh, food because certain foods can be very damaging if you have food sensitivities. But if any of you guys out there also have food allergies, food intolerances, or food sensitivities, you'll totally get it. I know how hard it can be when you have to kind of maneuver your way around with your diet to avoid certain foods and a lot of these foods that I'm sensitive to are in everything and so I have to be extra careful um, otherwise uh, you pay for it and it's very painful to go through the process of having to pay for it. Wow this looks like a lot is going on right here but it, it really isn't. I just happen to have like a lot of pots and stuff happening on that table and then all the jewelry and stuff that we just got at the gym show. Oh shoot you know what I just realized? I didn't tell you guys what happened at the GNLW show. Um, so both of the gym shows that came to town were very small and they're both wholesale only, wholesale to the industry or to the trade. So you know if you have a jewelry store or whatever. Oh shoot, you know, the AC's popped on. Hold on, let me turn that off. Anyway, don't mind that sound. It's going to pop off in just a sec. Now, both of the shows were super tiny. Uh, the Jogs uh, and then GNLW, 
Uh, both of those are wholesale only shows and we couldn't actually film in the GNLW at all. So I was lucky to get a few film clips and jogs because normally you're not allowed to film in there at all either. Um, so the wholesale shows are always really difficult to try to get any footage of for you guys or for videos because they normally don't allow cameras even in the building at all. Um, but normally I will film at the public shows and so that's why it's way more easier to get more footage for you guys during uh, the February, you know, the winter time gym shows. So I can't wait until the gym shows come around in February. Those are the real shows, those are the big ones, um, and that's when they're, everyone's here in town. Although I have no idea what's going to be happening with COVID-19 this year, um, well technically I guess next year. Even like just trying to get our supplies in stock this year, everything was just kind of, you know, thrown off due to the COVID-19, so import-export was off and being able to get my normal supplies in, uh, back in stock. So all of that was a little bit, um, you know, more challenging this year, but hopefully, hopefully things, you know, start turning around here. Um, so these baskets out here, those are for Michael's store. Those are from Pakistan. They're really, really gorgeous. And the quality and the weaves, the design and everything are just, look at that, and that's a tiny little basket. I think he's sending that one to his dad, but super, super cute. and really beautiful baskets like really well made and you can do really gorgeous like basket walls with these you know use them as um like wall art uh so those those tend to do really well locally here but i also asked michael if i could sell some on my website but, like if i could put them on my website um, he's thinking about it he's thinking about it but he really got these for his little store and his little um, or his booth in, in the antique shop Anyway, so if I do end up putting any of those on my website, then, well, I'll have to get uh, new boxes though first. So I have to order, I've, I gotta buy the, uh, the larger size boxes because right now I have uh, smaller boxes that fit like the crystals and stuff. Cause these are like, these are over a foot. They're well, they're like 12 to 14 inches. I think most of them, they vary in size a little bit, but yeah, anyway, I love baskets. Michael loves baskets. He wanted his whole little booth to turn into an all like a, a basket shop. So, um, but those are all his and maybe I can put some on the website. And then if you're wondering what the beads are, you can probably tell this is all turquoise here. I love turquoise. It's one of my favorite gemstones. It has been for many years. Sunstone is also one of my favorite stones and heck, I can't even, it's hard to pick. I do have, I have favorite gemstones, but um, a lot of them. I have a lot of favorite gemstones and then there's certain ones that just don't do it for me and that I find that Michael likes really opposite stuff than I do. I mean, he like he loves turquoise and sunstone and stuff too. Um, so he likes what I like also, but then he also likes other pieces that are kind of like, I don't know, darker, um, which is just, I don't know, I don't tend to like be as attracted to, I don't even know what this is, you guys. I mean, it's, if I can get it to focus, maybe you can tell me, hold on, if I hold that there, like you would almost think it's kind of like a Peter site, maybe like a little bit, but it's not. It's, it's something else. I'm just not sure exactly what that is, but oh, holy moly. Hold on. Let me show you this one. Now, this is something that I'm really into and that's Kazakhstan turquoise. Actually, Michael, oh, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. It's on like this really cushiony pad, uh, which is why I have that pad out here just in case I drop anything as I'm putting everything away. Um, so this is Kazakhstan turquoise. Gorgeous, you guys. This is also one of the most expensive turquoises I've ever come across. It's very hard to get because it's very rare. They have a really tiny mine, and so the little bit that comes out, like the mining is by locals. Like it's a very small village, and it's just one mine, and so you get just a very tiny amount. They're only using hand tools, and the weather is pretty severe there too, where they're getting it. Um, so it's up in the mountains, and yeah, it's it's just a very um, very small amount that they can actually get of the Kazakhstan turquoise. So whenever you see it, um, it's normally like this beautiful sky blue kind of color. This one is kind of really weird, <laughs> this particular piece, because it has like this white swirl, which normally it's not like that. You normally, oh, here, now I'm gonna get into this whole thing. <laughs> now I gotta go grab some more. Let me show you what it looks like, hold on. All right, here we go, here we go. You guys got me getting all my Kazakhstan turquoise out here. Now, some of the pieces I looked at after getting them and I was like, oh, no, I did not get these at the last show, by the way. This was from uh, last February. Um, and 
And let's see, do I have any pieces from the one before? Any, I slowly collect this stuff, okay? Let's just say that. And I get like a little bit at a time because it's so expensive and you don't really, you don't, like everyone knows, all the vendors know that with Cossack Shine Turquoise, you really barely make anything on it because it starts out so pricey. Um, but it's just how it is and I don't mind it because, I mean, you know, I only get to get a little bit, a few pieces at a time. But it's something that, it's a stone that you just, you just don't get. You can't get it hardly, you know. And I don't know what's going to happen when the mine starts to, you know, if they start to, you know, run out. So you don't know when that's going to happen, you know. So it's kind of like what you, what you have, what you see is all you get. And you don't know if you're ever going to be able to get more again. So, you know, it's just a very small amount that's available out there. And so it's not something you come across very often. There'll be like, of all the thousands of vendors that show up for the February shows, just to give you an idea, there'll be like maybe three vendors that actually have this stuff. And they only have it a little bit each. So, and they pay a lot for it too. So anyway, I just wanted to show you guys kind of what some of the different looks, like how Cossack Stand Turquoise looks. Whereas um, like that, you normally, you're, you're normally not going to see that, you know, because that's just a, a really weirdo <laughs> piece there. Um, but normally you'll see, uh, it'll either be super clean, like these pieces, you know, right? Or you'll have more matrix and everyone has their preferences. Both are gorgeous in my opinion, um, including any like weirdo pieces like that. So, I mean, you can't go wrong with this stuff. So I have some pieces that are already set in sterling silver. Um, this one's quite large here. That one, that one is a big, big pendant there. And then I have some that are just waiting to be turned into jewelry, which might go on to pieces like this that oh, if I pull back here, maybe you can see. So I do some long necklaces that are, you know, woven. Wait, will, will I be able to zoom in there? Uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit. Um, like this is a piece of, uh, a piece of boulder opal here. Well, there's Laramar, Boulder Opal, and Baltic Amber. And I mix up the stones too, so I like to, like this one, I used uh, Laramar with the Boulder Opal just because I, I liked the way it matched, and then Baltic Amber and Laramar. So uh, sometimes I'll do this asymmetrical design uh, like that, just as an example. You know, just uh, I like to be kind of random and just make jewelry that really stands out. And whenever I wear pieces like that into the grocery store or wherever, people are always like, "Where, where did you get that? I've never seen a necklace like that before." So it's just fun to you know mix up the stones and use like really rugged pieces, but they're still beautiful at the same time. You know, wait, oh sorry, I was so I was still zoomed in. Um, okay, so anyway, I was saying that, you know, I might, I might put some pieces on like cords like that, uh, or, you know, you can wire wrap them. You can have them set in sterling silver. If you want, you can make rings. Uh, these pieces back here are Egyptian turquoise, very, very unique look, right? So all the turquoise kind of has its own unique look like this right here. Um, and the he, she beads here, uh, not these, those are all different. These are all Kingman, Arizona turquoise. You know, they got a, they got a particular look. I really like the matrix in turquoise. That's part of what draws me to certain pieces is when it's not so perfect and clean, but when it also has matrix, like I like to see earthiness mixed into my stones, not all of them, but, but certain ones, turquoise is one of them. And then also. Uh, some more pendant like pieces which, which will probably uh, be going on either beaded necklaces or necklaces like that the woven necklaces um but i also have some sunstone here that turned out to be really gorgeous quality i was really lucky to get a hold of these because some of the sunstone like you'll you'll know when you're running through the gym shows you will talk to like i don't know say 20 people 20 vendors and they'll be showing you their sunstone right and they can be all different grades you normally see most of it being a little more opaque, a little more, I don't know, beigey. Um, it's just not, it doesn't have like that really golden, you know, really warm, ambery type of tone and the clarity. So clarity and shiller, of course. Um, so the shiller that you see in Sunstone, let's see, can I get in? Hold on. I'm holding my big DSLR camera and this is not a vlogging camera. It's very, it becomes very heavy after a while holding it in one hand. I don't know if you're going to be able to really see this pick up on camera, but the sunstone is gorgeous. Like it's really, really pretty, uh, very nice quality. So that's a grade sunstone there. Um, but anyway, we have some cabs over here. They're also sunstone. All right, you guys, I need to get a larger magnifying glass so I can actually show you in better detail. <laughs> but can you see the shiller in there? Do you see the rainbow effect is what I'm trying to show you here. So see that, that those are inclusions. 
and there can be include, well there's all different types of inclusions, but these particular kind that cause the shiller that is in sunstone, those are flecks of copper and they are gorgeous. They have like a gorgeous rainbow effect. So basically, they're sparkly rainbows <laughs> trapped inside of the feldspar, which um, sunstone is a type of feldspar. So sunstone being a type of feldspar, can you guys think of a couple of other types of feldspar that also are very pretty and shimmery? How about labradorite, moonstone? Both of those are also feldspars. And so sunstone is also in that same family of minerals. And then these beads here, these are blue topaz. So there's all different grades of blue topaz, and this is a natural blue topaz here, so it has not been heat treated or anything. A lot of times when you do see the real, the really bright, uh, very clean uh, blue topaz, it's been heat treated, which is perfectly normal. That's a, a pretty standard practice. But sometimes I just want the really natural blue topaz. I like both, but sometimes I just go for the one that's a little more subdued and natural. So I love doing all different types of jewelry, anything from really unusual pieces that are more statement pieces or where the gemstone really stands out. And I also like doing more dainty pieces where you get more sparkle, but maybe it's more subdued. Um, maybe it matches the person's skin. I like working with skin tones and also hair color. Like I like working with the, the color palette of people to match them up to certain gemstones. I think that everyone has certain types of gemstones that they really look good in. You know, like they're a certain color palette and certain gemstones just really fit their personal color palette. I was gonna show you one more piece here, which you already saw. Uh, well, you didn't see this particular piece uh, in the video yet, but this is Libyan Desert Glass. So I think we mentioned earlier, at least a little bit in the video, that this comes from the Sahara Desert, and this is a natural glass that's formed during a celestial impact. Now, they're not exactly sure if it came from a meteorite impact or if it actually came from a comet. Um, sometimes there's also what's known as an airburst, but they don't believe that this was formed during an airburst because of the amount of pressure and heat that was needed. I uh, probably can't get in very close there, but now this is just a loose piece here, but I also have some that are uh, set in sterling silver as pendants, and I have one ring left that I don't think is on the website, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to photograph it and get it on there. Um, well, wait, 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 hold on. Okay, let me take that back. If I'm going to sell it, uh, I may put it on the website, but I'm not sure yet until I know I can get more because this stuff can be very hard to uh, get a hold of sometimes. So luckily the guy at the Jogstrom show, he actually had a good collection of it. He'd been collecting for quite a while, but generally you don't see very many vendors if you go to the gym shows. You don't see very many people. You can ask all kinds of people about Libyan Desert Glass and there's only going to be a very small uh, handful of people that even know what you're talking about um, or you know have it or could direct you to someone who has it. So the funeral piece that uh, Tutankhamun was found wearing, uh, it had a centerpiece that was a scarab, right? So um, if you know about like uh, Tutankhamun or ancient Egypt, you'll definitely know that scarab piece. And it, that piece, that centerpiece, they used to believe that it was carved out of chalcedony, but it was actually carved out of this, Libyan desert glass. So this is actually the same type of gemstone that Tutankhamun was wearing. So the ancient Egyptians had this and used it as jewelry and also tools as well. Um, that is Michael's piece, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that already, but that's not going on the website. That's that's his piece. <laughs> so I gotta give that back to him. Um, uh, let's see, I think that's everything that, uh, yeah, it was just a couple of really small gym shows and I didn't get very much, uh, just a you know a handful of things that I wanted to get working with for, um, for the next upcoming season here. Like, look at this one. I mean, I love a lot of them, but look how like sunny and cute that one is. I love it. It matches, it matches my jacket. All right, you guys, shoot, I could just like be vlogging like endlessly <laughs> with you guys. But, um, I, you know, maybe I should just do more vlogs instead of just like these giant long ones here. I need to put this poor little baby back in a pot. I had to do a treatment on that uh, about two days ago. It had uh, root mealybugs, which was pretty shocking. It's a newer plant. It just came into my collection. I just got it not too long ago. And I finally got it out of the pot and then looked at it and it had some of the little cottony white fuzz on the roots. And I was like, oh shoot, okay, time to do a treatment on it and let's kill all that. So what you do is you take a jar, heat up the water to about 115 or 120 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and then you soak the roots. So I use a jar and I drop 
the little the little baby I set it like right on the jar so the, it's just picture the jar like going right up to here and then the plant just like sits on the mouth of the jar right so all the roots are completely submerged in the hot water um, well warm water warm warm to hot water so in that hot water I also add a little bit of dish soap so it's like hot soapy water and then I set the little cactus body right on the mouth of the jar and the roots stay completely submerged in the jar and then after it soaks for about 10 minutes in the hot soapy water then I rinse the roots and then I do a hydrogen peroxide treatment where I mix uh, one part hydrogen peroxide at 3% to um, let's see uh, two parts of water yeah so basically it's a, it's a third so it's like 1% hydrogen peroxide is what that brings it down to anyway uh, you guys don't care about any of that <laughs> I'm just trying to say I did the hydrogen peroxide soak on it right the hydrogen peroxide treatment helps uh, root healing too on plants so that is what this poor little baby is doing out and so I just let it dry out for a couple days and I'm gonna pop that up right now I also need to pop this one up too so that's why that one is in there this is a lobivia uh, uh, actually that that name changed though so what is it called now mm, I don't know um, anyway they're always changing the the genus and and you know reclassifying and everything all right you guys that's enough talking your ear off I will let you go and I will see you in the next video all right bye guys Look at this. I didn't even notice it was blooming. That sweet little baby is not even in a pot and it's still trying to bloom. Look at this sweet baby. Mammillary glassii. It looks like it's wearing pigtails. Its blooms are like perfectly on opposite sides. Oh, look at that. Ah, oh, we got a pollinator in here too. Get it. That's right. Come on. Oh, yeah. Come on. Get in there. Yep. Get that stigma. Okay, now you gotta go to the other one. Hey, hey, come back. You gotta go over here. I need I need some fruit on this thing, some seed pods. There you go. That's right. Get all that pollen on you. It, it it looks like a chinchilla taking a dust bath. Hey, you didn't get on the stigma though. All right, I don't want to disturb it. Maybe I should let them be alone together. All right, there it is, Mammillaria glassii. It came back. I know you want to get in there. There you go. So what I was going to say about this variety is it has larger blooms than the other varieties of Mammillary glassii. And they're these beautiful light baby pink. I love them. It is adorable. This thing seriously is like, a, I mean, is that not cute? Okay, now I'll let you guys go. All right, have a beautiful day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.